Well, I'm absolutely delighted to say that uh, joining me on the Godcast today is Steve Nallen. Now, Steve is a, a writer, um, he's a, an actor, he's an impersonator, probably best known for his, uh, his roles um, in the characters of Spitting Image. So I'm, I'm really delighted, Steve, to get you on the Godcast. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm very well. I'm looking forward to this chat, so it's going to be good. Where, whereabouts are you, Steve? Where's home for you? I'm in North London. Um, in Barnet. In fact, I'm on the on the the last road in London. So beyond me, uh, uh, there's the M20. The next road is the M25. Okay. So I'm near South Mim service station. For anybody who comes, uh, well, down from Yorkshire, down the A1. Um, um, uh, if it's the M1, it's a bit further. It's about five miles away. So that's where I am. And it's the north, the the, the tallest part. It, well, it used to be the tallest part of London in England com until you get to York. Right. So anyway, okay. you know, that's a bit of ge geography for you. I, I, know, I know you're a Yorkshireman, aren't you, by, 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 by trade. How long have you lived down south? Is south really home now? Yeah, I think so, because um, I've got a bit of an accent, but not much left. Um, I left Leeds uh, to uh, university when I was 18 or 19, and I've never really been back. Um, I mean, stay with family over Christmas and all that sort of stuff. But uh, no, I've never, I've never lived. Um, I'm thinking about it. You know, I'm, I'm 61 now. So I talked to the family and, and they said, well, why don't you move back to, you know, sell your house in London, move back to Ilkley or Whitby, or, you know, somewhere like that, which sounds nice. I wouldn't mind doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you, you're, you're on the verge of this exciting venture um with your with your book that's coming out how, how are you feeling about this time are you nervous excited it's it's a weird thing to you know uh, uh, the book and stuff um it's a weird thing thinking about the fact that somebody might be reading what you've written because when you're on stage you know you're performing you're there and it's live and even spitting image when i was doing that show and other shows you knew from 10 10 o'clock till 10.30, somebody was going to be watching it. But it's slightly weird when you when you think about, um, you know, that the, 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 there could be a, anybody just reading it right now. It's just it's a bit odd, really. Anyway, I, I, if they are, I hope they're enjoying it. Yeah, and this book is uh, The Time That Never Was, is uh, my copy, which you very kindly sent to me. Is this is this something that's been long in the in the ether? You know, Steve? I, I, I used been in there. I think for probably 50 years. Wow. <laughs> because I always loved stories. Uh, I was, I was, I, I'm very slightly dyslexic. I've never been tested, but I am slightly, I know I am because of the way I look at numbers and stuff. And um, when I was about 14, I was a, I used to deliver the Yorkshire Evening Post. Um, and every time I went on a, on a newspaper round, I used to invent a story. That's what kept me going. Um, and in fact, I invented a story Monday to Saturday. And then there was a cliffhanger at the end of each each day. Uh, but I was not good at writing. You know, I was a terrible speller. I couldn't write. And when I wanted to write stories at school, what I used to do was I, I used to write the chapter headings, uh, chapter one, chapter. And I knew what happened in the story, but I knew that, you know, actually writing it was going to be hard work. And I just didn't think I could do it. And then somebody said to me, I said, I thought, I'm not a great writer. But somebody said, yeah, but you're a good storyteller. Mm. You know, you can fix the writing. Uh, it's harder to fix the storytelling because you're a great raconteur and storyteller. So I, I, that's why I did it. And um, we'll talk about it, I'm sure, in a minute. But, you know, that, and, and what happened was a few years ago, I got um, a, an E. coli infection and it kept me awake for six nights. And we know when you're kept awake for, you know, that length of time, your brain starts going a bit doolally. And then suddenly in the middle of the night, I had an idea and I thought, this is a really interesting idea. And, um, and then I thought, oh, I'm going to write it. I've always wanted to, you know, write a big story. So, and that's what I did. Can, can you remember the, the day when you sat down and, and wrote the first page? Can you, can you recall? Well, that? actually, the, the, I do. Um, oddly enough, I planned, I planned the whole thing out in my head and on notes, so I knew exactly what happened. And I actually didn't start on the first page. I started in the middle of the story. Um, and P.D. James, the crime writer, says the same. She said, um, she said she never begins on the first page. The first page is really hard 
to write because she wanted it to be perfect. And she said, don't start on the first page, start in the middle of the book. Um, and, you know, uh, 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 and don't worry about what it sounds like. Mm. Um, so that's what I did. I thought that was very good advice. Yeah, so, I, yeah, I, I, I do. And I sent it to a neighbour who's sadly no longer with us. And um, and I thought, well, if she likes it, she's she's a very honest woman. Uh, if she likes it, then I'll keep going. And she loved it. And she said, I want more. And <clears> so <throat> that's how it, you know, it slowly, slowly progressed. It took about a year to write. Mm. Um, and I sent you had to take a year off to do it. So somebody who's been on the Godcast, uh, Steve, was Geoffrey Archer, who, who who is a prolific writer, who, who said he still found joy in sitting in front of the computer um, with the story, but not actually know, knowing quite where his imagination would take the story. Was that the same for you? or were you, were no, you... no, mine's a mystery uh, story, and you, you need to know the end of the mystery before you tell it. And I've also worked with writers, playwrights, and I've worked with playwrights who've written Act One, not knowing what Act Two, what happens in Act Two. And I thought, well, how can you do that? Um, and I think, you, put it like this: you need to know what happens, but not necessarily how it happens. Mm -hmm. So the imagination stuff can change. And and actually, I was writing the book, and I realised there was a huge flaw in the book. In the, at one o'clock in the morning, and I spent the next five hours till six o'clock in the morning working out how to solve this problem. Um, and I, I took the day off after that. But, <laughs> so, so this this book is um, well, it's it's the first of a trilogy, isn't it? And yeah, um, well, but but, but, but one um, that is there now, um, and book two is written and completed, uh, but it needs editing and so on. And then I've still got to write book three. I know how book three ends. Um, so I know how the whole, but I don't quite know how it ends. You know, I know what happens, but sort of not how it happens yet. Are you chomping on the bit to get on with that third book, Steve? Or, or... Yeah, oh, oh, editing and proofing <laughs> and uh, sorting, you know, everything out it just you know it takes forever and it's actually months now since i've actually sat and written mm. um uh so yeah it, I, I, that's what i'm looking forward to yeah, yeah getting back to writing book three so 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 this book t tell our audience a little bit about it it, it, round, it revolves around what's known as the swidges and uh, you've you've got a wonderful uh, website that backs this up and that people can can go and take a look but but tell us about um the swidges and, and william well, I I tell you what happened, uh, uh, to cut a very long story short, it was my 50th birthday. This is how it, 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 it the, the origin of the story in a way, it was my 50th birthday. And I came home and a, a tile from the roof fell in front of me. And th the guy said, uh, if it had fallen on your head, it would have chopped your head off because it's, it's an old house, big. And I said, was I sort of 10 seconds from death? He said, yes, you were. And then I thought, well, you know, there might have been somebody I met on the way who stopped me, said hello, and as a result of those 10 seconds, I was saved. And I thought, well, supposing there is switches that they, they sense an accident is going to happen to somebody, and then they slightly knock them over, or they, they say, oh, can, can you light my cigarette, or what's the time? And that 10 seconds saves their life or some sort of accident. And that was the that was the germ of it. I live in a in an area where where loads of schools and there was one day was a, a lad was running for a school uh, and he might have been late or whatever he was. And there was a sharp turn and he didn't see a huge van coming. And my instinct was I just grabbed him by his blazer and pulled him back. And he was within a split second of being hit. He just didn't know that the traffic was coming. And, and so I switched him, you know, I, I just, just stopped the accident. And I thought this is an interesting idea. And then I sort of just then developed, you, you know, developed it from there. The switches never know what the accident's going to be normally in my story. They just fix the time. So it's, that's, it's all about time. It's all about fixing the time. Um, it's almost as if the universe at the beginning of creation, uh, the universe and time was slightly out of joint, put out of joint, and that's 
sort of what I've developed this sort of story where at the very beginning of creation um, it should have been, the world should have been perfect and, and the universe should have been perfect but time was just put out of joint so we, the switches are here to fix it yeah and and, and tell us about the, William Arthur the character so tell us a little bit about him and, and well he's, he's switches are never noticed they don't want to be noticed um but um he's not daring he's not imaginative he's just one of the he's, he's got this switcher energy that that just makes him not trick people up but just pull them or whatever to stop and that's what he does he's not interested in doing anything that's his purpose in life but then something happens and then uh, a character comes along we can talk about her in a minute and says that's ordinary switchers you're different there's something different about you and every so often uh, the, the switchy world as it were create a, a, what they call a hopeful monster that's going to do something really, really special with time. And he is that special switcher. Yeah. Um, and it's me, really, um, because, you know, when I was a kid, I was at the back of the class. I didn't say anything. I was, you know, I, I wasn't well known or, you know, I, I didn't play football. I wasn't particularly bright. I wasn't, you know, I was just the ordinary kid at the back of the class. And, uh, and, and the character that comes on, she has to turn him into something a bit special. So she takes him from uh, uh, somebody who's, who's, re who's not re remotely daring or, or imaginative to somebody who has to be daring and imaginative. Yeah. And, and this other character, I, I presume we're alluding to, is, is Granny. Well, I realised that, you know, if you're going to have this sort of young lad, they, that, you know, you, you need the... You need the Gandalf equivalent. I'll do my Ian McKellen for you, just to say hello. I'll do my Ian McKellen. You need that. Oh, you need, you know, you you, you need uh, Professor McGonagall, you know, from Harry Potter. Uh, Miss Maggie Smith. You need a character like that. So um, I, 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 I thought my, I'd use my own grandmother and I'll call her Granny. She's not his grandmother. Uh, she's just called Granny and she's just really eccentric fun character who 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 turns him into a you know the more daring and more inanimate but she always does it in a funny way that's the thing about books i've read a few books and they're on my shelf at the back and they're great books um but they're not funny and I, I, you know i've lived for 50 years i began on the northern clubs uh, as a comics impressionist and I thought there aren't any funny books, so I just wanted to make her, make her as funny as possible. And that's what kids have loved more than anything else. They, they just love the fact that she's so irreverent. And, mm. and, and, and she, she, there's no point in being daring unless you're fun, having fun doing it. That's yeah. the point. And was your granny funny? Um, I think she... <laughs> in the book, <laughs> granny tells very unfunny jokes, but she doesn't realise she is funny. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That she, she, she tells really, really bad jokes that she mm. laughs at, but she has no understanding that she is hilarious. Uh, uh, and she gets cross when people start laughing because she doesn't understand it. Um, and that's sort of based on... My, the granny character is based on, on... In fact, I've got a picture here. I've got, I've got, I've got, probably won't see it very well, but I put this up. These are all my grandmothers. The... the, the the, the, the lady in the, uh, the sort of sepia colour, the yeah, tallest one is yeah. the grandmother who brought me up. That's my father's mother who used to like to show a bit of leg. She was a lovely, lovely, loving woman. Um, my mad auntie, uh, Janie, with me, I can't see that very well. And then there's my aunt um, Marjorie who helped bring me up. So um, they're all in her, you know, yeah, they're, all, yeah. they're all in her. Yeah. If, if you're watching this on, on uh, YouTube, you'll be able to see those images, but... Uh, if you're listening to this by the uh, the uh, podcast, then um, you'll see you can see those images on your website, Steve. They're the same. Yeah, they're all on the website. Yeah, but if you, yeah. I think if you go to, it's called Curiosities and Trivia, and there's loads and loads of pictures of Granny and and loads of other stuff as well. Yeah, and um, uh, you know, I, I you know I, I'm in the process of of working on a book, Steve. Just tell us a little bit about that process of, you know. Um, there's so many people out there who love writing, don't they? Um, but but it, it's not always straightforward getting a publisher, is it? It was, was oh, that, that's, kind of... pretty much every literary agent in London. I've got, I've got again, I, I'll 
find them for you. I will, but uh, I think it's okay. Oh, here they are. Um, uh, that's the collection of literary agents I sent the stuff to. Gosh. And they all said no. <laughs> um, and, you know, that took months to sort out. And, and what I eventually did was I thought, right, the literary agents don't like it. Let's get it into schools. Let's see if the kids like it. And so I rang my neighbour as a teacher and I knew another teacher and, and, and a teacher in Manchester. So I said, look, will, will you get your kids to read it in, in, the, in reading groups and stuff? Yeah, sure. They loved it. And they wrote really nice things about it. And then I sent them to the eight, to the literary agents. Look, like, this is what the readers have said. And they still said no. Mm. So I, I thought, okay. But eventually we did find a publisher. It's too complicated to go into all, all that. But it, it was uh, it was it was sort of 128 no's and then one yes. And you only need one yes. You only need one left, yeah. one yes. Yeah. And I was very lucky to get it. Yeah, I think there's a key message in there about keep going, particularly, you know, if you're an aspiring author, because um, because somebody says no, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad book, does it? No, absolutely. Well, hopefully not. I mean, it, it's and the kids liked it, you know, but I think the thing is that they, they, um, I, I watched a thing on, on YouTube recently with a literary editor who basically said no literary editor was looking for Ulysses. The point being that when something unusual and different comes along, they don't recognise it. They want something that they're familiar with, um, something that, you know, they can put on the shelf because they, they can, that, you know, it's the same as somebody else has written. Um, and when something a little bit unusual comes along, and my book is, people say it's really weird in, in a good way, but it's really, it's, it's not, not your normal stuff that, that uh, gets written. Um, it's difficult to say whether it's a fantasy or science fiction because it's based in the real world, but there's an element of, fantasy in it but there's no magic in it it's not a magical story the, the, there's no vampires in it there's no you know it, it's it it's and there's no time machine in it um it, it's not clear actually exactly how all the time shifting stuff happens i know how it happens and it does get explained but um it, you know so it's not a science fiction story with a tardis and stuff so it's not an easy book to put on a shelf but that's why the kids liked it because they said look it's got comedy bit of science fiction in a way it's got fantasy it's got a little bit of not horror but it's a bit of danger it's got mystery and it goes from one to the other it's funny then it's odd and, and they, they love the mixture so maybe i don't know literary agents just didn't get it so there we are and i think it, what i would say to directly to is right just write mm. and actually nowadays I came to a think it was going to be sent to a publisher and, and I, if, it, if this publisher doesn't want it i'll self-publish it's not difficult to self-publish now. No. Get your book written and get it published. Yeah. Because do it yourself. And it's not, you do something called print on demand, Amazon run it. Um, and you need a, you know, I think it's, I forget what it's called now, an, an IS something number. And you, you, you it's easy to do. It's yeah. not difficult. To do. Yeah. And not yeah. expensive. No. And, and Steve, you talked about that, uh, that near death experience. <laughs> Is the book uh, in any way, uh, semi-autobiographical is, is you know have you called on your life experience for this book i think that it's my grandmother i ran away from home when i was 14 my father was um a, he had schizophrenia my mother died when i was nine she just came home one day and died um and and it was that moment i thought my entire life has changed i just remember because i saw her body coming out the house and that's it. My life is now completely different. It's on a different track. My father was schizophrenic, so we lived with him for five years. It then became impossible. Uh, an evening or two before Christmas, back in 1975, 74, when I was just 14, me and my sister just ran away from home. We didn't know where we were going to go exactly, but we ended up at my grandmother's, and she had an attic. And... Um, the house was condemned that she was living in. It was slum clearance and it was due for demolition. So for two years, it took two years to get rid of us. Um, we were the last family in the street. Uh, I lived in the attic with my, uh, my sister was there and my auntie who was in this little two up, two down. It sounds a bit like the, the, the 
Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, but so uh, you know the family in there. But I, I don't want it to sound like poverty porn. I don't mean it like that because because I regard my grandmother as my rescuer. Yeah, um, uh, she rescued me. I don't know what would have happened with it had we have stayed with my father because he was he was he was really, you know, not not at all well. Um, I still kept in contact with him, and I at his requiem mass he was a catholic um he um i i did the eulogy so i, I you know i never lost lost contact with him or anything like that yeah. um <clears throat> but but no my grandmother was my favorite and my grandmother was born before the titanic sank so here i was in the 1970s a teenager being brought up with a woman who was essentially an edwardian and she'd lived through two world wars when she was 10 that was the middle of the First World War. She had two kids in the middle of the Second World War. She was a tough, tough lady. And uh, she'd known true poverty. And so if I complained about anything, you don't know what you're talking about, Stephen. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you don't know you've lived, you know, just, you know, you can't. And it was tough love. She wasn't a, um, a big lover and kisser and all that sort of stuff. My other grandma was, you see, this is the point about granny in, in, in Switches. Mm. She's a sort of composite of all of them. Mm. One grandma was tough love, the other one, as soon as she walked in the house, oh, come here, Stephen, give us a big love. Give us a big love. Oh, <laughs> you know, um, which... But, but Steve, Stephen, that's, that's not, um, that's not a, an easy start to life, is it, for, for a young guy? Did, did that affect you in, in later years? Uh, did, did you have to go through a process of unpacking all that or i think it took me well um it took me 10 years to cry about my mother's death you know you, we lived in that you've got to be tough you've got to be a big boy now um we, we didn't go to the funeral we were taken to see hello dolly and it was it was all pretended that the funeral never happened all these must i think these were adults that made mistakes that we should you know we sh we should have being told what was happening at least and we shouldn't have been lied to and that's the thing that I was lied to um, uh, by adults who should have known better and I knew they were wrong so that stayed with me you know I've been less trusting of people over the years because of that um, and we weren't encouraged to show emotions and all that sort of stuff and then when I was a student at university in the first year I came back and I remember chatting to my grandmother very late at night she'd lost She'd lost her daughter. And I'd lost my mother. And we had a real, I don't know what you'd call it, um, a, a shared grief. That, and um, I cried like crazy that night. And so I, I'd waited 10 years to do it. Um, and actually, I'm sort of getting a bit a bit upset now but but um uh i think when you have a big cry it sounds an odd thing to say but i think once you have what i would call almost a primeval cry for somebody that was so important to your life you, you then can move on but i've met people in my life who've never done that um and so i i really encourage people to talk about things to get those emotions out to uh to cry when you need to and it it it, it, it helps with where you know that's the nature of stuff mm. but i had this this unique bond i think with my grandmother um because of you know the maternal yeah daughter connection and and you you talked about your your dad being a, a roman catholic uh, um has, has that experienced um, influenced your perspective of faith matters? Are, are you a, a spiritual person, Steve? or, or are you, are Well, oddly enough, I, I, I think so. And there's a spiritual side to It's a secular spiritualism. I, I love this. Uh, I went to a Jesuit school. Um, my father took us to um, uh, Novena on a Thursday, confession on a Saturday and mass on a Sunday. So we were in church three times a week because um, his schizophrenia came out in um, in a particular type of Catholicism. Um, 
So I, I you know, I, 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 I struggle a bit with that. At school, we did the saints and stuff, and somewhere along the line, I, I came across. I think he's called Saint Irenaeus of um, Lyon, and he wrote that um, you will find God in a man fully alive. And okay, it's slightly sexist, but you know, let's say nowadays you will find God in a human being fully alive. And I just think that is the most wonderful expression of what God is. Um, that 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 life enhancing, living your life to the fullest, um, and that can mean writing stories, loving your children doing what you're doing, going out into the community and making a difference. That's something I, I listen, I can't do what you do. It's not, it's just, I, I don't have that in me. It's just not my nature. Um, and, um, but what I try to do in the book is, is, is have these characters make a difference, a small difference, it's seemingly a small difference to somebody's life, but get them to make a difference and let them witness it. And there's a scene in the book where I won't go into details, but somebody gets to be fully alive because they do something really wonderful for, for their orchestra in the school orchestra. And, the, you know, the pupils play incredibly well and, and Granny makes a difference there. And, and, um, uh, and she said, look, that's a man fully alive. That's what we're here to do. And she has this wonderful expression. She says, we, you know, Swidge is a, Switches are here, you see. The reason my switches are here, love. The reason, I'm sure, that's how she's going to talk in my book. The reason my switch, we're here to help them sing the song they're meant to sing. And that, I, I don't know where I got that from. I might have made that up. Um, I just love the idea mm. of, of God being um, uh, uh, found in a person fully alive. And if we can help, each other to sing the song that we're meant to sing mm -hmm. then we're doing god's work yeah yeah very nicely put steve thank you steve you you've thrown in a few voices there already well, no, let's, let's do margaret thatcher <laughs> we haven't done margaret thatcher um well where did you get the where, where I love, um, I can do, I can't do impressions, but I can do accents quite well. And I've always loved the, the rhythm and, mute and, and of, of sounds of people's voices. What, what was the, um, what was the first impression you did when you thought, oh, I can do, I can do voices here? Well, we, we at school, um, I remember somebody said to me, they started doing an impression of Brian Clough, you know, the old Derby County yeah. manager. And he said, I can do Brian Clough. Now you see, what are you doing? He said, oh, do you know, like that, that bet you do Brian Clough. And I said, that's interesting, but I can do Brian Clough without holding my nose. <laughs> and they said, how did you do that? I said, I don't know. Um, and then, you know, the, the, and then some um, um, the other voices, you know, came along back in those days. I can't remember who I was doing. I was doing Prime Ministers, you know, people won't remember. People will remember people like, um, oh, that's what I did at school. I, my teacher, we did Noah and the Ark, uh, Flanders and Swans, Noah and the Ark. And uh, it's so written that you can do anything, really. So they, so uh, we, we, we the, 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 the people of Noah's village were sent their leader and it turned out to be Harold Wilson. And I can tell you the first joke I ever told on stage when I was about 15, I think it would have been. And uh, it, it's quite a good joke, I think. He said, you see, now the problem, the problem with Noah's God is he is interested in confrontation. Well, he introduced the six-day week for the start. Now, actually, you know, that's a quick, for, 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 for a nice little gag. And yeah. that was the very, very first gag I ever told. So it was, it was, it was a God gag in a Jesuit Catholic school. Yeah. Um, and... Um, so it wasn't it wasn't massively strict, but and it's a good gag. I, I think it, I was thinking about it the other day because uh, Johnny Walker, who was my uh, English teacher at school, um, and I've actually he died some years ago, but I've I've sent a copy of the book to um, uh, to his widow Mary, and because uh, he was you know you, you know that's a, 
okay, I had no mother. I had my grandmother, that was great. But my father was absent. And I've realized what you do is you gravitate towards um, the mentor that, that, uh, that you want yeah. Um, yeah. or you need. And, and Johnny Walker was my mentor at school. He was a good man, um, a kind man, and very funny and slightly irreverent. Um, and uh, uh, he uh, and he was I pretty much all my values I got from him. Yeah. And and how soon did you know that you wanted to be um, in showbiz, for want of a better word? How, how, uh, how soon did you know you? Wanted I to don't be think I, I don't know about the showbiz thing because I didn't realise that. Um, you know, I didn't think it was possible. I didn't. I didn't. I had. The, we had the Northern Clubs. That's all we had. And um, so I used to see acts doing, you know, doing stuff. Um, and that's how I started, you know, performing. Uh, my grandmother would take me to. I couldn't go. I was too young to go to pubs. So I said, "Look, can you take me to a pub?" Um, so I can do talent shows, which I started when I was about fifteen. But I'd always dressed up. Uh, I'd always I had a scarf, and and every scarf every position of the scarf would produce a different character and I'd make stories up and stuff like that. It was, I found that was from the age of five onwards. So there was, I don't think there's ever a doubt of what I was going to do. I just didn't know how to do it. Yeah. But you'll find a way, you know, you, 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 you find a way. Uh, and Listen, I'm going to be honest with you. There's a lot of egotism in it. You know, let's not pretend that, uh, that there isn't to get up on stage and say, listen to me, I'm going to be funny or do a joke. There is a lot of egotism. But at the same time, it's weird. There's always self-doubt. It's this weird thing that you, 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 you want the attention. Um, but at the same time, you're very doubtful. And I've, I've, I'm not going to mention who it is, but I've only met one performer in my life who seemed to have no doubt about his own talent. Mm. Everybody I've worked with has after they've done a take, um, they look look around to see what everybody's reaction is. Even the very, very best comedians I've worked with. Yeah. Steve, one of my heroes is, is Les Dawson. I, I've, um, I, I'm a huge fan I met of Les Dawson. I met him once. And, and, him you, and you played in Sissy and Ada, is that right? What, what, was, the, uh, what was the appeal of that? Uh, was, it the, was it that characterisation that Les brought to his well, I, yeah, I, I, was, I was, so they did the Sissy and and I knew, uh, sadly died, uh, um, Barry Cryer. And uh, what used to happen was when he was, um, when Les was um, at Yorkshire Television making Says Les, he and Roy used to improvise their grannies to each other between takes. And Barry Cryer overheard this going on one day. So what are you, what are you two doing? Oh, well, just, just, we're just improvising, you know, a bit, a bit, a bit improvising. That's right. I'm, I'm playing this character, you see, who's a slightly, slightly posher than Les's character. You know, she drinks sherry. Well, I drink stout. <laughs> and um, I said, lads, this is, this, is a, this is a sketch. And that became Sissy and Ada. Uh, and when you watch the Sissy, we don't get stuff like that nowadays, and, uh, but they were just funny, you know, and... Uh, being from you know from Leeds, you're on, you know the other side of the Pennines, but um, we all recognised Sissy and Ada, and there was joy in 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 um, in 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 what they did. And, and when Les and uh, Roy used to do it, you could see them laughing with each other and, and enjoying it. And they did it with such affection and love. And and um, a play was written, which was about the relationship partly between. Les and, and Roy and, and stuff. And one of the most wonderful moments was we did the show at the Lowry and in Manchester or Salford. And Les Dawson's daughter came to see it. And she said the most wonderful thing afterwards. She said, thank you for giving me two more hours with my father. Oh, gosh. Well, Eric Potts, who played Les was, you know, it was just, yeah. and it was the affection, you know, the, le, okay, let, let's say something. There's a special Northern warmth in the humour, I think, mm -hmm. without being unpleasant to 
anybody else. There's a special northern warmth, which I'm not quite sure always is, 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 is achievable if you haven't been born in Lancashire or Yorkshire. That's my opinion. Yeah, I think that's true. And, and, and that was one of the reasons why I used, I used to, I don't watch Coronation Street anymore, but I used to love that for the same reason. Those rich well, I, comedy northern women, you know, the Bet Gilroys, and they were just wonderful characters, weren't they? Well, they, they, they and, 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 and Granny in, in my little book, She's she's in the Hilda Ogdeny, Ina Sharple. Mm. She's a mixture of all those. Um, and I've stolen a line from a very old Coronation Street. I'll, I'll, I'll admit that for for Granny. Um, and that uh, that I watched it, it was a blow black and white one. And Hilda Ogdeny saying, uh, uh, "I'll tell you this once because I'm not the sort of woman who boils me cabbage twice." <laughs> That's you know. That's the, a wonderful line. Mm. It's poetic. Mm. Um, and, um, and I found another one, which I did some research, you know, the, the mills in Lancashire. Uh, don't just stand there like cheese at ninepence. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I do. I love it. Just, and, 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 you know, this is, I'm, it, this sounds pretentious, but it's poetry. Beautiful, it is. It's beautiful. It Don't is. just stand there like cheese at ninepence. <laughs> you couldn't write it, could you? <laughs> you couldn't write it. That's the point. You couldn't write it. You have to listen. Yeah. You have to listen yeah. to what um, people naturally say. I'll say this one because I'm not the sort of woman who boils me cabbage twice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Steve, talking of strong characters, you, you, um, you made the role of Maggie one of the strongest characters your own I can see spit an image now it, it was incredible and I think you took Maggie to a different level you know I, I remember the likes of uh, Janet um was it Janet Brown Janet Brown yes and Faith Brown who, who both did that character and um, but you you brought I think what you brought maybe was was a bit of um I don't know what well, I brought word. an edge to it I suppose y yeah I suppose. yeah um, Janet, I knew very well. We we got on incredibly well. We we met at a theatre, and I introduced myself, and she was. I know I know her son very well, Tyler, um, Tyler Butterworth, and um, um, she was lovely. But you know, the, the the caricature of the Thatcher character needed an edge. That that, that you know that's what that's not what the, the, the wonderful Janet Brown did. Um, so um, I'm going to move away from the Mac. So I took. Um, the, the voice of Thatcher that she did in the House of Commons. The right honourable gentleman doesn't understand the nature of fiscal policy. He does not understand the nature of European policy. And he doesn't, and, and, I, and I then turned that into the way Mrs. Thatcher dealt with the cabinet. Um, and, and of course, she could also be very, very gentle and very, very persuasive. And then suddenly, you idiot, stop messing about. It's like Punch and Judy. Mm -hmm. and, and I sort of realised that um, without going, getting obsessed with my grandmother, my grandmother was an alpha woman and um, Mrs. Thatcher was an alpha woman. I don't get on with alpha men particularly well, but I, but I, love, our, I love strong women. I love the Ian Sharples and the Hilda Ogdens and so on. And uh, I realised that, they said, why do you think you're good at doing Mrs. Thatcher? I said, because I'm attracted for some reason, psychologically, to strong women. What's wrong with that? And it's continued because you know I, I, I think I, I, as I said I do Maggie Smith and that down to Nabby. and uh, and Whitcom <laughs> and you can't get more alpha woman uh, than Anne Whitcom. Um. <laughs> yeah, she's a great. She's another wonderful character. I do the women better than the men. You see, I, I mm. you know. I do and, I did, know and did you like Maggie? Um, you know, what was your I know, and I think uh, I don't think you met her an awful lot, did you? But what was your relation? No, you know, I, I did. I, I, I semi. I, 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 she was in the same room once, but we, mm. we never met. I, I don't think she got. She understood money. Okay, she understood money. I don't think she understood communities. I just don't think she got that whole, that whole world that, you know, you can argue about the, you know, the, the pits closure. Uh, Mrs. Thatcher, Harold Wilson closed more pits than Mrs. Thatcher did. And you can argue that when the pits were closing, um, 
the industrial revolution was coming to an end uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. And coal was coming from Poland. It was much cheaper. So the financial side of it, you could say, OK, I understand that. She never, ever understood the importance of a community, that when you remove the, the primary industry of that community, you are threatening that community. And she never put enough support in to help that transition. OK, the pits were going to close and possibly some of the big industries were going to close because they've stopped building ships in, in Newcastle and they now build them in Korea, whatever it was. OK. But you've got to support the community. And I still think, I think we're now still living with the effects of that. Mm. Um, yeah. That's my opinion anyway. Steve, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you. It's been a real, a real pleasure and, and joy for me. What, what's, um, you've obviously got the, the excitement of the book. What about live performance, Steve? Are you, are you, are you? Are I'd you... like to, um, I, I enjoyed touring. Um, uh, I, I'd never toured before until a couple of years ago and I did a big tour. And I loved going to, and I and 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 I I went I love going to Minsters and I love stained glass windows. And oddly enough, yesterday it's a complicated explanation, but I was actually um, invited somebody who lives, friend man now lives in Westminster Abbey. He said, Do you want to come to the Abbey? What? So yeah, yeah, I live there. You live there? Yeah. <laughs> wow. And so he took me around the Abbey and I just, I just, I don't know what he is, you know, the I've got candles in my house. Mm. I love candles. And uh, somebody came into my house and said, you Catholic? I said, yeah, how did you know? You've got candles. <laughs> you know, you, 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 you go to church three times a week, Steve, when you're seven, eight, nine, whatever. Um, uh, novenas and confession and, and mass on a Sunday. Uh, it's candles. You just get used to the smell. And, and so I've got candles everywhere. You know, proper... Uh, raw oh, proper time. candles, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Proper, proper candles. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> fabulous, fabulous. Well, listen, I, I really wish you all the success with the book, uh, um, you know, and, and, and I really hope that uh, people pick it up and read it and um, it does tremendously well. And uh, just thank you so much for your time, Stephen. And, and we send our love from the north down, down to Barnet and, and say thank you for coming and on I, the podcast. And I say thank you very much and find God in a person fully alive. God bless you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. <laughs>